Father, again, we just want to praise you that um, the good shepherd knows his sheep, his sheep know him, and they hear his voice and respond. And so we pray that uh, this morning we might hear the voice of the good shepherd as we um, listen to your word and pray that you'll help us to respond um, in repentance and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right, so we're in um, John chapter 12, 1000. Um, and 80, and we'll try and keep that open because we're coming back to it. About um, a month ago, there was a pod of about 150 pilot whales that got into some difficulty on, uh, in Western Australia. Uh, 50 of them ended up beaching themselves. And why does, it, why does a whale beach itself? Well, we're not entirely sure. It might be one of them gets sick and the other follows, or maybe there's so many buzzing noises around in the sea that they just get disorientated and they get themselves in a real, uh, real tricky position. Well, um, these 50 of these beasts found themselves on a beach, and um, 70 people from various government agencies went down to help them, and uh, other people went to get stuck in as well. And here's the thing. Um, uh, Whales, this probably shouldn't surprise you, but whales cannot live or survive for very long on a beach. Uh, they don't survive on a beach. Uh, there is an issue of their mass, so their bodies um, effectively cannot hold their weight when they are not in the water, and so they suffocate. And also they, are, they need water to keep their sort of skin fresh and so that's when you see when you see this sort of thing happen that's when you see the the helpers the rescuers they pile down to the beach and they're trying to bathe them in water and and kind of keep their skin nice and uh wet and then they try and roll them over onto mats and drag them back into the sea and the challenge then is to get them to go in the right direction to not re-beach themselves and i guess as you see these these whales on a beach, you see something that is both magnificent and something that is deeply sad. It's magnificent because you'd never get to go that close to such an incredible beast. You never see them like that in the sea, and they're huge. And yet there is some real sadness as well because we know a whale is not designed for the beach. Uh, they are meant for water. And in the water, wow, they kind of do their sonar thing and they're swimming and splashing and dropping and diving and turning and playing and hunting and thriving. They can stay alive for a little while on the beach, but too long and they die, whereas life for them is found in the water. Now, over the past month, we've been in John's Gospel, if you've been around on Sunday mornings. And uh, John is an eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And in essence, Jesus in John's Gospel says, humanity finds itself like a whale on a beach. Um, we are a, we, there is a beauty to us, and there is a beauty to living in this world. And I don't know how you're bank holiday Monday was. Um, in the afternoon, I took my girls for a walk from Overstrand, if you know that, to Cromer. And um, the sun was out, and it was magnificent. And we got to Cromer, and we got to enjoy some pound fifty Mr. Whippy ice creams. And it's the joy of ice cream. Uh, and then we got, you know, this week, we've got to sort of have a, uh, a takeout with some good friends. And there is a, there is a beauty at time to life. And there, yet there is also sadness. Uh, there is a sadness to life. And so, you know, on the day, what happened? Well, it wasn't all play sailing. Uh, one daughter smashed another one in the face and didn't apologize. And then, you know, you have a phone call and a, a family member is deteriorating from Alzheimer's. And it's just really sad to hear. And then you, um, you say something because you're feeling a bit stressed. And it is harsh. And it hurts someone, and you meant to hurt them, and then you need to forgive. You know, you need forgiveness. You need them in your lives. And we kind of know it shouldn't be like this. Um, 
people whose phones, you know, you forget where your phone is, and then you know, it's just, it's stressful, isn't it? Um, it's really stressful. Um, Jesus says um, that because humanity finds itself on the beach, that basically he says we, humanity finds itself on the beach. What do we mean by that? We are, we reject God, we're cut off from him, we're living with the consequences of that. And although there's a beauty, there is also a mess. And actually, humanity is not designed for life in the beach. It's, li- it's designed for life in the water. What is the water? We're designed for life knowing God, enjoying the love of God through Jesus Christ, reflecting his ways in this world. Now, it's not a promise to fix everything in this life, although um, living with God is, is, is what we were made for, and it makes all the difference as you hit times that are hard but it is definitely the promise of a glorious future beyond death now and that's what we heard as a church family in the stories of uh, jack and amy and we heard a little bit in the second service from jack and the passage we had read to us um we we saw uh, a number of responses to jesus as they are confronted with who he is And there's a couple of big things we're going to think about from the passage. And the first thing is this. um, The invitation to life with God through trusting Jesus is wide open. Uh, The invitation to um, to life with God through trusting Jesus is wide open. Now, if you'd been here at the first service, you would have heard how both Jack and Amy said they were building their lives um, on Jesus now, that they're, they're... What does that mean? It means to build your life on the basis of who he is and um, what he has done, all that he has done. And if you have a look at verse 44, uh, we're made absolutely clear who he is. Look at this. Verse 44, then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I've come into this world as a light so that no one one who believes in me should stay in darkness. He says, look, um, humanity is living in darkness. And what does it mean to live in darkness? It means to not know the God who made you. It means to live life on the metaphorical beach. But he is the light. And in what way is he the light? Just have a look at verse 45. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. Okay, he's saying, who is the one who sent him? He is God the Father. And he says, as you look at me, you are seeing the perfect image of God. In other words, as you get to know me, you are getting to know God because I am God come down. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. Um, You are looking in the eyes of a 30-year-old Middle Eastern man. And he says you are looking into the eyes of your creator. Now that's that's, that's quite a big thing to say, isn't it? It's huge. Here is a man who is a carpenter by trade who uh, never traveled the world, never wrote a book, uh, and he is saying he is the creator of everyone and everything. He's the creator of you and me. And that everyone has to come to a decision on who he is. Um, if, again, if, if you were here this morning, um, you'd have heard how uh, Jack and Amy looked into the evidence for who Jesus is. And there is a lot. He's a real historical figure. Uh, he turned human history upside down, not through an army or amassing a great portfolio or loads of wealth, but through saying he's God come to rescue and backing up those claims by dying and rising again. And that is what Jesus is saying. Okay, that is what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 44. Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. Verse 47, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He says, look, I am the light. I am the Savior. I am God come down 
And you need to believe in me and you need to make a decision on that. Now, um, I guess there might be people here or people watching online. There certainly was in the first service people who'd, who'd never really heard this stuff before, had never really heard that God has come down so that we can know Him. And, and, and uh, it's all pretty new, but maybe you can kind of relate to this feeling of being like a beached whale, of thinking there is a beauty and a mess to life and I can't work it all out. And what is the purpose and where is the meaning now, I just want to say, if that's you sat in the room, um, uh, there'll be plenty of other people in this room who have been on that same journey. And as you look around, you may not believe it, but uh, this room is full of some pretty rational people. And actually, they've come to know Jesus, and they would say he changes everything. And they'd say, man, you need to think about this. Now, uh, just for those of us who've been Christians for a while, which will be most of us, that'll be most of us. Um, I have to say, um, have you ever had a wobble in your faith? Have you ever had moments where you thought, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why don't you make it easier? I think there's a whole host of reasons why people can have wobbles in their faith. Um, sometimes, actually, it is sin. You know, I just think of a friend of mine who had become a Christian at university, and he rang me up, and he said, Andy, I just don't think it's, I'm just not sure it's true anymore. And I said, well, do you, have you come up with any new evidence for why Jesus rose, didn't rise from the dead? Do you think he really still rose from the dead? He said, well, I think he did. And actually, as we pushed and pushed and pushed, he said, actually, Andy, I've started dating my old girlfriend. We've started sleeping together. And I know I just can't live like that and still believe this. And so it wasn't that he'd become unconvinced. It was sin that had led him to doubt. Sometimes it can be sin that can make us wobble. But other times, it's just suffering. And we just think, Lord, if you're good and in control, why have you allowed this? Uh, sometimes it can be just intellectual doubts and you just have moments and you think, really, is this really true? Can I really trust it? And God says, this is how you can know I am here. This is how you can know I am good. Look at Jesus. Look at him. He's the bedrock. He's the one that's compelling. He is the light in a dark world. He is the Savior. He is the one who's come to bring us from death to life for all eternity. Look, uh, the first big thing I think we see here is that the invitation to life with God through trusting Jesus is wide open. It's open to anyone who wants to come, whoever, whoever, whoever. But the second thing, and this is the slight kick in the tail. This is the sting. Um, the invitation to life with God through trusting Jesus won't always be there. It won't always be there. You see, um, one of the questions that is bubbling around in John chapter 12 is um, why aren't more people believing in Jesus? I mean, he's literally physically there. Okay, they can see him with his eyes. They can experience his miracles. They could go up and touch Lazarus, right? Lazarus who was dead and now alive. Um, they can talk to people who were there, who were sat on the side of a kind of a hillside as Jesus taught them all day, then took five loaves and two fishes and broke them and broke and fed the, fed the masses. They kind of know the, the hospitals are emptying when Jesus rocks up. There's no waiting list. No need for the MRI scan. He's dealt with the issue. They know that. And yet, why are we about to head into a point where they kill him on a cross? Why do they see all this truth and reality to who Jesus is, and yet they reject him so violently? And... Um, 30, verses 37 to 41 tell us that actually God knows and he's not shocked by it and actually he's in charge of even that. He's absolutely in charge. Look at verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they would not believe in him. 
Look at verse 39. For this reason, they could not believe in him. Would not, could not. I'm sorry, I know it's daft. I know it's daft, but it just got, it just got into my head. The 90s and early noughties TV program, which um, at, a, a, as a student, we would watch religiously. Can't cook, won't cook. For those who, some of you don't know it, some of you do know it, there were two contestants. Someone who couldn't cook, uh, and they were generally rubbish in the kitchen, someone who would refuse to cook, and they would both get thrown in with a couple of celebrity chefs and given some ridiculous ingredients and try and cook something, and people voted on what they thought was best. Anyway, can't cook, won't cook. Um, Jesus says when it comes to him, some people won't believe, and it results in them can't believe. They can't believe as a result of that. Just have a look at it. Have a look what he says. Um, Even after Jesus performed so many signs that they still would not believe in him. The evidence was there, but they refused. They would not believe. They'd made their decision already. And so they wouldn't believe in him. It was just so plain. But they'd already made their decision despite the evidence. Now, look, let's be clear. That is a tragedy because they are beached whales. And he's saying, I'm going to get you into the water. You're dying. And I want to bring you to life. And they go, nah, I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to reject what I can rationally see with the, my eyes and what I can, I'm just because I don't want God in my life. I don't want him being in charge. I'm going to do my own thing. Look at what the um, would not believe looks like. It's really interesting. Have a look at 42 to 43. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. That looks good, right? So even among the leadership, they are believing in him. But look, read on. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than praise from God. It said, look, they looked into the evidence. They kind of knew it was true. But even though in their hearts they knew it was true, they thought, I am not going to follow him because it's going to cost me too much. They, they loved human praise more than the praise from God. They knew actually they would not be treated with the same level of respect when they rocked up at the synagogue or they rocked up at work or they rocked up at the, the, the cricket club or whatever they did as their social. They knew if they owned Jesus, they would lose the respect of other people. I, um, I, I, was, I couldn't quite get over this, um, but I was chatting with someone involved in the Christian Union uh, up at UEA, and they said, um, they said the student welfare officer, uh, not a Christian, he said to them, hey, look, um, it's really tough being a Christian on campus. It's actually way easier telling people you're gay than telling people you're a Christian. Um, and I don't know whether you feel a little bit of that. In our culture, in the workplace, with your friends, owning Christ." There was a cost, and that cost will grow. It's very small for us in this country. But these are people who actually, even though they know it's true, say, I'm not going to believe because I care more about what people think of me than what God thinks of me. And so there is a warning here. Okay, Um, They would not believe. And look, this is in fulfillment of what Isaiah the prophet said. Verse 38, uh, Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you look at the little G, can you see the little G? You really need a microscope, don't you? Unless you're really big glasses. But the little G, if you look at the bottom of the page, that has a reference from Isaiah 53, verse 1. And Isaiah is written 700 years before Jesus came. Uh, It is a prophet. And actually he says... The one who they have not believed in, which will be Jesus, is one who, humanly speaking, you look at him and you think, wow, he's not a looker. That's what Isaiah 53 says. He's not a looker. You'd walk past him and you wouldn't look twice at him. He doesn't look humanly impressive. And yet he is the creator come down to give his life as a sacrifice for all who will trust him. And so verse 37, they would not believe. God knew that. 
But this is the tough bit. Look at verse 39. For this reason, they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. For this reason. He says, Jesus says, look, um, uh, you've seen so much. I've given you so much. And you keep saying, no, 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 no. There's a point where God says, well, it's too late. In fact, I'm going to harden your hearts and you're not going to be able to turn and be healed. You know, it's interesting. One of the things I find about people who are looking into um, the Christian faith, often they look into it thinking, well, God, you've got to prove yourself to me. You've got to look at, you've got to prove yourself to me. And as they start interacting with the Gospels and as they start meeting Jesus, they find it's not so much that they are putting God in the dock going, prove yourself to me. But they find Jesus is actually putting them in the dock and saying, do you realize what a problem you have with sin? Do you realize actually your biggest problem is not what you think it is that you've got to, you know, sort your job out or get these friends. Actually, your biggest problem is that you're a sinner facing a righteous and holy God and you desperately need to be rescued. You, you, you're kind of putting God in the dock, but actually you read the gospel and you find Jesus putting you in the dock and saying, you can't stand still on this. There is only one hope for you and it's me. Uh, we had a friend, um, an auntie of a friend, and um, for years she's not been very well. And uh, my friend is, you know, they were constantly set nagging, her, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the doctors. No, 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 no. Finally something happened which forced her into the doctors and he said it's too late. It was an illness we could have treated, but it's too late. Could not, would not, would not, would not, would not, could not. Here is Jesus. And his arms are open wide. And he's saying, look, I have come to rescue you, to have relationship with God, to rescue you from judgment, to rescue you for relationship with God, which starts now and lasts for eternity. Don't be a would not, would not, would not, would not, could not. Now, I'm aware there'll be people in this room who, uh, this is just brand new for, and this, you've never really heard about this before, and we're using words like sin and God and Jesus, and you're just like, I'm, I feel a bit like a beached whale, and maybe something in this, and I need to look into this. And if that is you, um, we'd love to see you back on a Sunday. We keep opening up the Bible. We look at Jesus. We run um, courses like this one, Hope Explored. There are leaflets there. There's some started in, in September, and you'd be welcome to come to that and ask any questions you want. You are absolutely welcome to come to that. But then there'll be others of us who have been around and we've heard it over and over again and we've said tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Don't assume that there'll be a day where that offer is always still open to you. If you'll hear his voice today, do not harden your heart. Just cast your mind back to those whales, the whales on the beach on the seashore. And I guess as they were there, they could probably look around at each other and think, this isn't so bad. It's not so bad on the beach. Look at you. Hey, you're much bigger than I thought you were. Look at me. Have you seen the flap of my tail? This is great. But as the sun comes out and the skin starts hardening and the weight on those lungs and the breath starts going they realize they are in trouble and they only have one hope and that is the kindness of someone else to wash them to push them to drag them there's only one way they can get into the sea see that is the jesus we have met the jesus who is willing to take on flesh to become one of us so we can know god we can know he's there, but the one who's willing to take on our sin, if you like, 
huh, to push us on the mat and drag us into the sea. He is our only hope. But if we repeatedly refuse to come, there is no hope. I'm just going to bow our heads. Bow our heads. And I'll just give you a moment to talk to uh, God in prayer. And then I will pray.